Um, so joining us today, I am I am stoked. We have Greta Takuta. So Greta is a PhD candidate at MIT, and she's working with Dr. Ev Fedorenko, who we just had the pleasure of hearing from last week. Um, before MIT, though, Greta received her bachelor's and master's degrees in molecular biomedicine, which is cool, from the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. And we were just talking about earlier about how all of her, a lot of her uh, publications have Hanson co-authors, which made me smile. Um, her research combines neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and cognitive science to study semantic processing and temporal dynamics in the brain. But when she's not busy sciencing and being cool on all those domains, she's also an award-winning photographer and an avid reader of magic realism books. I, I looked at your, your reading list and I noticed your recent one was I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, which sounds both terrifying and intriguing. This um, is so, <laughs> yeah, please, this is great. Please welcome me or join me in welcoming Greta Takuta. Thank you so much for the nice introduction and thanks so much for the opportunity to uh, speak today. I'm really excited and nice to virtually uh, meet everyone. Um, so yeah, today I'll be speaking about um, artificial neural networks as models of language processing in the human brain. And this is um, a result of a collaboration with uh, Martin Schrimpf, another grad student at Brain and Cognitive Sciences at MIT. Um, Idan Blank, who's now faculty at UCLA, and then two other grad students also in brain and cognitive sciences at MIT, Karina Kaum and Ekbal Hosseini, and then it's supervised by Dr. Nancy Kanrischer, Dr. Josh Tenenbaum, and Dr. F. Fedorenko. And yeah, everything that I'll be presenting is obviously a, a product thereof. Um, so I think for, for everyone who has not lived under a rock in the last uh, couple of years, you've probably seen uh, titles like this, uh, basically all these papers trying to merge uh, artificial intelligence, neural networks, deep learning with neuroscience, cognitive science, uh, and psychology. And obviously the idea that neural networks can serve as theories of neural computation, um, it's not new. Uh, in the 80s, during the parallel distributed processing movement uh, with these like connectionist networks, um, these networks were already being proposed to be like solutions to problems in perception, memory, and language, um, but it didn't move much further at that point. Um, so now there's like a huge like surge and this like interest of using these like neural networks um, as models of like perception and um, cognition. Um, so this, a lot of these papers uh, mention notions such as we are interested in comparing the representations between neural networks and the brain. And that sounds great. That's exciting. But to me, that also sounds kind of vague. Um, so this brings me to the outline of this talk. Um, and I would really like to first give an introduction to using artificial neural networks, ANNs, as models of perception and cognition. Uh, then I would like to present some preliminary results um, in the domain of language and also how can we exploit these networks and can they actually teach us something about language and cognition. And lastly, I would like to take this vague notion of comparing representations from neural networks uh, to the brain um, and try to like make it more um, make it more evident what is actually going on when you compare these representations um, to talk some more like methodology. And feel free to just like unmute and interrupt if you have any like clar clarification questions. Um, I try to like in the uh, final part of my talk to like uh, recapitulate some like discussion points. So I hope we can leave like further discussion for the end, but definitely just unmute and ask if you have any, any questions. All right, so the idea of using neural networks uh, to model perception um, started especially in the visual domain. So this is a paper uh, by Yemens et al. from 2014, uh, where they state that they can use these hierarchical models, as we now know as convolutional neural networks, to model responses in the primate uh, visual ventral stream. And in this experiment, they used um, uh, responses from uh, macaque monkeys um, from the uh, IT, from the uh, inferior temporal cortex. Uh, and they showed different images uh, from various uh, categories. 
And then what we see in the bottom part here is uh, in black, the actual neural responses from the macaque brain. And in red, we see model predictions from these convolutional networks. And I think it's important to highlight here that these red traces are not just like a fitted model, but it's actually like a held out um, prediction uh, on like an unseen test set. So we see these models actually do pretty well. Uh, what they also found, which is, is pretty interesting, is that there is a connection between task performance. And as we're like in the visual domain, then here task performance was image categorization performance. So how well some of these neural networks could categorize images. And then on the y-axis, we have like the, um, the explained variance in the IT cortex, so the neural explained variance. And what they found was that there was a relation between these two, meaning that models that perform better on this like image categorization task also map better onto the brain. And basically, they su this suggests that uh, using performance optimization um, can also be used to build these like quantitative predictive models of neural processing. And then I had a slide where I wanted to talk about why is this a good idea? But after some time, I changed it to, uh, is this a good idea? <laughs> and um, now I actually decided that we're gonna leave this for the end. So I'm not even gonna talk about that now. Um, so the scope of this talk is that we have seen that these um, artificial neural networks have worked well in modeling the uh, sensory cortex, for instance, visual and auditory processing. And now we basically wanted to ask, can we exploit these networks to inform us about high level language processing in the human brain? And here by language processing, I refer to the extraction of meaning from spoken or written phrases, sentences, stories. Um, so this uniquely human ability is kind of an interesting domain because it's, it bridges perception and high level reasoning. So this is what I'll focus on in this talk. Um, and to investigate whether you can map these neural networks with the brain, we use an approach called uh, benchmarking. So in the top part of my slide, uh, you can see different stimuli. In this case, because we are talking about language, these are sentences. Um, and the basic idea is that we want to present these sentences to models and to humans. So these are our experimental subjects. Uh, so we basically want to present identical stimuli to the models and to humans, and then see how do the internal representations compare. Um, so in the lower part of the slide here, you can see that we have, uh, we present some sentences, we extract model activations, and then we want to compare it to the neural recordings from the human brain. And I'll go more into depth of that. So to start out, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, the human system of interest in this particular case. And uh, here we're interested in the core language network. And uh, yeah, I heard that uh, Dr. F. Fedorenko gave a talk last week. So to the ones who are there, you probably already know a lot about it. But just a, a quick recap. Um, the core language network is a set of left lateralized regions, um, mainly like frontal and the frontal and temporal part of the brain that support high level language processing. And this is beyond like the low level auditory and visual perceptual stage. Um, and the way we define this network is by using a contrast, um, for instance, an fMRI, it can also be applicable to other modalities. Um, so a contrast between uh, sentences and uh, non-words. So by doing this, we want to define like a part like these participant specific functional regions um, as the core language network, because um, as Dr. F. Fedorenko has shown previously, um, there are like a lot of uh, intersubject anatomical variability, especially when defining these regions. So it's probably suboptimal to just like define them in like a anatomical stereotactic space. So these are functionally defined. So in our particular work, uh, we used a data set. This is our main data set, which was an fMRI data set from a paper, uh, Pereira et al. from 2018. And in this paper, um, subjects were exposed to visually presented sentences. So in particular, 627 sentences, and we had 10 unique subjects. 
uh, corresponding to approximately 13,000 voxels in each subject. And uh, by having this data set, we can construct a stimulus response matrix. Here, the stimuli are sentences, and the response are the voxel responses from the human brain. So in this case, we would have these like 627 sentences as the rows in the matrix, and then columns, we have the voxels across the participants. Um, and this is like a small example of some of the sentences. Um, beekeeping encourages the conservation of local habitats. Uh, these sentences were all like naturalistic sentences. They were kind of like Wikipedia style. Um, they were spanning like a broad range of topics and were presented in like small passages of like three or four sentences within like the same topic. So now we talked about the uh, human data set. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about the models that we were interested in. In. And um, in our approach, we actually investigated 43 um, diverse state of the art uh, artificial neural network models for language. I'm not going to go into like a lot of depth in like describing these models. Uh, we can talk about it later if somebody's interested. But briefly, um, we had uh, three categories of models. Uh, one is the embedding type of models. Um, I guess some of you are probably familiar with like GLOVE and word to vec um, And the next uh, category was these like more recurrent networks, like LSTMs. And then by far the, large, the largest uh, group of models was these uh, transformer architectures. I think we have 38 transformer architectures. Um, so these span both like the BERT family, XLM, T5, Albert, GPT, and these names just refer to different like subcategory families of transformer models. And these um, transformer models are these like architectures that have really like revolutionized like language modeling within the last couple of years. And they transform one sequence into another with the help of like two parts. So there's an encoder and a decoder part. Um, but it's really efficient because it has like attentional mechanisms. So it performs really well on like language modeling tasks. Um, Just and, uh, yeah. a, a question from the, the chat. Um, so yeah, James sure. asked, um, what is the reading level of the stimulus sentences? So um, the sentences were presented one sentence at a time, if that's the question. Um, I think maybe like the, or, or the like how level. correct me if I'm wrong uh, in what you're asking, James. Um, if it's the reading level corresponding to like how difficult the sentences are, um, I actually don't know exactly which like metric I would like classify that as. Um, sorry, but it was like very like naturalistic type, like similar to what you would find like in a simple like Wikipedia article. So it wasn't like super simple sentences, but it wasn't obviously like really like syntactically or semantically challenging. Awesome. I, cool. I actually also had a question about these sure. um, language models. Um, yeah. So forgive me because uh, I am, you know, kind of new to um, ANNs in general. Um, so I'm wondering like what this like attentional attentional like component is that you were talking about and like I I think um, last year we did uh, I had we had some exposure to like the word to vec like models but like where like where is the attention coming in um, in this right. type of model All right um, that's a good question um, so in these like transform models you have like these like two structures like the encoder and the decoder and the attentional mechanism comes into play that the model kind of like says like skims through like a sentence find out what are like the important things to focus on and then kind of like passes that through the network so you always like know oh now i this particular part of the sentence is of interest and then continuously like updates it's like uh, embedding to like optimize the performance this was like a very short uh <laughs> explanation because these networks are wildly complex um Sense. But actually, yeah, but actually, yeah, this slide was on like the objective function on all these like language models, which is, yeah, what is language modeling? And I just like illustrating that here, uh, which is 
um, basically a task of predicting the next word or character in a document. So what all these like language models uh, try to do is to maximize the probability of seeing the next word or minimize perplexity. And perplexity here is like, you know, kind of like a value of like surprisal. So you want to be like as little surprised as you know possible um, when you like model these things. Um, and just like another short comment, if anybody's interested in either reading or working with these like transformer models, um, then this library called Hugging Face Transformers is incredible in terms of implementation. And they also have some really good like guides as to like, what do they do? How can you extract a perplexity metric? How can you tokenize? It's like they have really, really good resources for that. So I can definitely recommend. So a huge shout out to these um, this library, because some of these models, as you can probably imagine, are both like wildly complex and really hard to implement. So they really made this task much easier. And um, last comment about the models is that um, we kind of like had two goals in mind by choosing these models. The first one was, you know, can these models even like predict neural responses? And the second one was, do they predict differently? Can we distinguish them? Like, is there any difference between them? Cool. So now we have an idea of like the models and the human recordings. So now an important point is, well, how do we want to compare these things? Um, and to do this, we want like a proxy for like a similarity score. And on the left hand side, we see uh, again sentences as rows and model activations as columns. The model activations depend on exactly which model you have. And then we have the brain uh, recordings in red here. And what we chose to do, uh, I would love to discuss this like uh, further um, in the end of the talk because there are many ways of doing this. But the way that we did it was to uh, fit a linear regression. So just like a simple linear regression from the model activations to the brain recordings. Um, and then what we do, um, we take, we fit this model on, sorry, on 80% of the data. So it's basically like a K-fold cross-validation, like a five-fold. Um, and then we have like a held out 20% uh, model activations. And based on this, we try to predict the brain responses. So this refers to like an encoding approach where, you know, you, if you think about it, you are kind of like trying to ask, you know, how much neurally relevant information is present in these like distributed model activation representations. And then when you have a predicted um, a brain response, you can basically just measure the Pearson correlation, like an R value between the predicted and then the actual brain response. And that is what we denote as our like similarity score. And then a thing you're like, well, which granularity does this happen on? Like, what do you fit it on? And um, oh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. So, of uh, course, go ahead. Uh, for the last slide. Um, so, I wonder the, because there are different models. Uh, so, I wonder the, the, this model must have different like uh, number of units because we calculate the weight of the, this unit. So, I just wonder if if they are have different number of units or they have actually uh, approximately similar uh, like layer or units. That's my first question. And also another question is, like, do you mean the, the cross validation, do you help out the subject or still need it? Right, uh, those are two great questions. Um, to answer your first question, um, in terms of how big are these like model activation units, whether they're approximately similar in size. Um, it's a really good consideration and questions because they're not, they're not identical. For instance, some of the embedding models, they would have like dimension 300. And some of the like larger transformer models have dimension, like uh, one of them has like 700 something. Then I think the largest embedding size we have is 1,600, which is a GPT-2 Excel model. So they do vary. And this is a really, I think, yeah, interesting thing to discuss, like how does like the model size actually matter for like downstream, like interpretation of your results? Yeah, good question. 
And your second question in terms of what we are fitting it on, maybe my next slide will answer to some of that. Let me know if it doesn't. Um, so here we work with like um, fMRI data. So uh, I know this plot is on the surface, but we work with like volumetric uh, fMRI data, so voxels. And we basically uh, were fitting um, one model per voxel. So we would get one score, one correlation value for every single voxel, for every single participant. And I think maybe what you were asking will also was kind of this slide possibly, which is then, all right, we have like these like correlation scores across uh, subjects. So let's say in this example, we have three subjects that performed the experiment. So we get um, a correlation score for each single voxel, for each single participant across all these like three subjects. Um, then what, what do we do with that? Um, so what we chose to do was, um, let's say like the first X number of uh, correlation values here corresponded to the ones from subject one and the next ones from subject two and from subject three. Then we uh, take the median within a subject. So you would get one uh, predictivity score here for subject one, the next one for subject two, and then a third one for subject three. And then the last step to get like uh, an aggregated value is then to take the median of those subject wise values. So we end up with, you know, one um, predictivity metric. Can so now we're, hmm? sure. Can I ask a clarification question? Uh, so of you course. said you're putting the model activations. Is, you're talking specifically about like the output nodes or are you relating uh, like sub layers as well? Right. This is also a great question because, as you mentioned, some of these models, some of the models only have one layer. Some of the models have 12 layers. Some of the models have like 30 something layers. Um, so we actually treated every single layer as a model. Um, so meaning that if you have layer number 10 in a certain uh, big model, then we would use that particular layer to actually extract activations from that layer. Uh, that being like the hidden states of that layer. Exactly. So for the larger models, say we have like um, one of the GPT models that has 12 layers, you're actually like kind of investigating 12 different models. Okay, thanks. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, so now we have this like aggregated predictivity metric. So now we're almost ready to see like how well do these um, models then fit. But because obviously, as we all know, neural recordings are inherently um, noisy. They have different like signal to noise ratios. Uh, we wanted to kind of like normalize this score so that we kind of like divide it by like the upper bound of how noisy the data set is. Like how well can we expect to even predict? Um, so to do that, we have like a normalized predictivity metric, which is that aggregated predictivity I just mentioned, divided by an estimated ceiling. And the estimated ceiling is like an extrapolated reliability of that particular data set, which kind of like places an upper bound of like how well, given the noise in the data set, can we expect to predict the data? So for this particular data set, um, we found there is an asymptotic relationship around seven subjects. Um, and then we divide all our, uh, we normalize all our predictivity values by this value of like 0.3. Um, so here is, I guess, <laughs> a result uh, or a, a part of the results, which is uh, on the x-axis, we have the different models that I explained uh, before. And on the y-axis, we have this predictivity metric. And as we see, um, the models are able to predict the neural data to varying degrees. Uh, what is interesting to see is that here on the right-hand side, the blue bars uh, this is the GPT-2 family. Um, I don't know if somebody has been on like Reddit or Twitter or something. You've probably seen the hype about first GPT-2 and then there was this site called Talk to Transformer and now there's GPT-3. Um, so yeah, it has received kind of a lot of attention. But what we find is actually that uh, GPT also maps pretty well onto the brain. Um, so now we saw that 
but um, I think an interesting point to talk about is like, all right, we see that we have these models that can somewhat reliably predict the neural recordings, then like, can that teach us anything? Is that even interesting? Like, what can we do with that? Um, and in order to answer that question, I'll quickly want to like take a step back and um, think about the question that we initially wanted to ask, which was like, what are the mechanisms that are underlying human language comprehension? And this is an example of like a core goal in neuroscience where, you know, you have like some stimuli, some input to the human brain, and then you go to like extract some kind of meaning from it. So can we actually use these like neural networks to help us like answer that question? Um, and I'm gonna go over uh, four, three different uh, points. And the first one will be, do these models like even generalize? Can you like take another data set and have the same uh, predictivity? Um, are they reliable? Like, or are they just like, is it just like lucky that they fit our data set? Um, another point is that do they map onto some like task performance as we saw in vision? And the third point is that, can we use these models to teach us something about different brain regions? And the last part is, can we dissect these models and like mechanistically start asking like, what makes these models like fit well to the brain? So first tapping into the first question. Um, so I was explaining, we have this like benchmarking approach and in order to like figure out whether this actually generalizes, we would want to have many neural data sets. Um, and we refer, we refer to this approach as like integrative benchmarking. So we are trying to find some things like a model that can explain several data sets and not just a single one. And in the optimal scenario, we would uh, not only have neural measurements, but we would also have different types of neural measurements, behavioral measurements. Um, so we could imagine having both like fMRI data sets, intracranial recordings, EG, MEG, um, behavioral, say like reading time. So we would have like an integration of different metrics that we could then call like a brain or human score. Um, so in this particular work, uh, we had uh, two additional data sets that I will briefly talk about now. Um, so in addition to the Pereira data set, which was this uh, fMRI data set, uh, we had a data set with intracranial recordings. Um, so in this case, we had five subjects uh, who read uh, pretty simple sentences, eight word long sentences, uh, presented one word at a time, given like the increased um, temporal resolution of the uh, ECOG responses. Um, and then next we had another fMRI data set, which was different from our first fMRI data set um, in the sense that here uh, subjects were reading stories. So it was not like fixed sentences. It was literally just like a, a story. And it was also presented auditorily as opposed to uh, visually in the prayer paper. Um, so this data set, which is from Blank et al. Uh, 2014, um, here we also had five subjects and then they were divided into like different story fragments that we were then trying to predict. And as I mentioned, an interesting thing to look into is like how well do these like predictivity scores then correlate across data sets. And the first plot um, I'm showing here is kind of an easy uh, like slightly easier, more simple comparison, because uh, in the Pereira data set that I've been talking about the last 15 minutes, um, we there were like two sub experiments. So there was one experiment, which was um, say like 250 sentences, then there was another one that was like 350. And different set of subjects performed these experiments, but the materials were somewhat similar. They were not identical. They were like new topics, new sentences. Uh, but first we checked whether like these two scores correlate well. And fortunately we found that great, they actually correlate really, really well. So what about the um, harder comparison, which is for instance, generalizing from the fMRI, the Pereira scores to the Fedorenko data set, which was the ECOG data set. And we also still do see that there is um, a correlation not as strong. 
And lastly, generalizing between the two uh, fMRI data sets, we also see that there's a correlation in the like uh, predicted uh, values, yet uh, it's interesting to see that in this other fMRI data set that would, that consisted of these like naturalistic stories, um, it was generally predicted lower than our other, other data set, um, which could be due to several reasons. Um, because maybe some of these models like lack this like long range uh, context or other reasons that we could discuss too. Um, so, all right, there's some generalizability. Obviously, in the optimal scenario, we would have many more data sets um, and they provide different, you know, strengths to like validating this approach. So next. Okay. Um, question yeah. about generalizability. Um, yes. Does this, and, and maybe there's like something here that um, like maybe there would be identical, but um, if you train it the opposite way, like say you train it just using the blank data set, um, right. is the is the relationship the same or is it is it stronger perhaps? So you say you would train these models just on one data set and then you would try to generalize to other data sets. Yeah. That sounds really, really hard. I wish that was possible. <laughs> no, I think I think what you're pointing out now is like an ultimate goal for sure that you would predict on something and then you take another data sets like that's completely independent and then you would basically use that as, as like the held out thing. That is would be incredible. Um, but from I think what we have seen is that it is actually still a quite challenging task. So we are cross validating across sentences, but if you start cross validating across like larger chunks of data, so you say you pick out like eight sentences or like a full topic, and then you want to generalize that within the same data set, it's definitely harder than just sentences. So ultimate goal, yes. <laughs> I guess maybe a follow up to this. Um... Kind of pushing pushing the limits here potentially but like so you have like you know these like cross domains like visually presented and auditorily presented but have you considered using like i don't know say like a movie data set where like there is auditorily presented word stimuli um but there's also these like rich visual components that are happening that are also kind of creating meaning for the subject um, and then feeding just the text to the model um, Right. Um, no, I think this is a really interesting point. And I'm actually very, very interested in this like multimodal perceptual integration. Um, yeah, I would love to do that. So <laughs> we haven't looked at it at all. Um, I've, I've been thinking a little bit about like how one could do it. You know, there are like certain models, language models that are trained on visual input. Um, I think I've mainly looked at like image type of networks. So they learn to like look at an image extract like a visual embedding and then you go from a visual embedding to like a textual embedding and then to predict text and yeah i've been like pretty curious as to you know can you use that embedding to then predict the language responses because we always or like most often um encounter language in context with other modalities right so there should be some really interesting link there yeah this is something i'm very interested in pursuing further for sure thanks cool thank you um, so yeah, now I'm just gonna briefly talk about uh, task performance. And just to remind us, um, in the visual domain, we saw this like pretty interesting link between like um, image categorization and neural predictivity. And now we can ask, is there like a similar link in language? And um, as I briefly explained earlier, uh, in language modeling, we use perplexity as like a metric. So the lower perplexity you have, the better your model is performing on this next word prediction task, which is the goal of language modeling. Um, so we looked at here on the x-axis, we have this like perplexity metric uh, called like a next word prediction benchmark, uh, which is on a data set, data set called Wikitext2, which is like Wikipedia articles. So basically asking how well can these models like predict the upcoming word in this like data set. Um, and here, notice the axis is flipped, so lower is better and is on this end. 
Um, and on the y-axis, we have these like three neural data, set, data sets aggregated. And what we find is that there's actually a relationship between the performance of these language models and then the neural predictivity. Um, so one might think, all right, that's cool, but maybe, you know, these, you could take any metric maybe, and maybe it would just correlate. Like maybe this is just like a lucky coincidence, right? Um, so what we did was that there is a, like a suite of like language evaluation tools called GLU, which stands for General Language Understanding Evaluation. And this like, they have like different benchmarks for testing, um, different sentence understanding tasks. Uh, an example could be like negation, like lexical entailment, uh, analyzing like the sentiment of the sentence. Um, so then we tested whether um, our neural predictivity was like correlated with any of these tasks. And we actually found that it was non-significant. So therefore we see that there is like a uh, selectively, uh, like the neural response selectively correlates with this like performance on the next word prediction task. So this might suggest that optimizing for these predictive representations could be like a critical shared objective goal of both biological brains, the human brain, and then also artificial neural networks for language. Um, next, uh, I would like to pinpoint um, whether we could possibly use these models to teach us anything about brain regions. Because in vision, you know, there's like somewhat like a coarse mapping of like the different processing. You go from V1 to V2 and so on. And there's even like anatomical um, data on that. So there's like somewhat a, a mapping between function and anatomy. This in more like high level language processing is still pretty unclear and debated, you know, how exactly these like regions interact with each other. Um, so basically like can we can these like models like guide us towards maybe understanding what different regions of like the language network are doing and um, what we see here is across just like five different subjects uh, we see their surface uh, projected language regions uh, the top uh, two rows here uh, is the model uh, predictions from GLUF, this like embedding type of model. And the color scheme here uh, corresponds to how, how well um, the predictivity is. So we see that in general, as you also saw in the bar plot, that GLUF predicts the regions pretty poorly. Uh, somewhere, maybe on like some temporal regions, it's predicting better. Maybe we can Maybe it suggests that, oh, like this uh, optimization goal for GLOVE, which is co-occurrence, is possibly represented in certain areas. Um, and similarly, this is like the predictivity map for uh, GPT-2XL, which was our top performing model in fMRI. And we do see that overall it performs pretty well, but there are still some regions that are maybe predicted better than others. Um, that being said, it seems to be that there's a lot of like variability among subjects. So it's pretty challenging to draw like any like clear conclusion from this. But this is just to illustrate that, you know, possibly you could use this tool to look at, oh, if you predict uh, region A of the brain pretty well with this model and this model was optimized for task B, then possibly um, you could start extracting more like mechanistic links in that way. Um, I have a mm -hmm. So in your last slides, because we know the languages are left letterized, so is it uh, like natural to expect maybe we have better predictivity in the left hemisphere, or it's it's not an assumption? Or... I think this is a it's a good question. I think it's it's definitely a reasonable assumption. Uh, for sure that you would predict better in like the left letter, left um, in the left regions. Um, I can't remember whether we looked into comparing left versus right. 
Um, I mean, you can, of course, like eyeball and be like, oh, maybe like left is predicted better than right. But I actually cannot recall whether we looked into it consistently. But I think it's like a super reasonable assumption. And yeah, you would predict that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, of course. Um, and as um, was already asked earlier in the talk uh, regarding like, what do we do with different layers of the models? Um, we you know extract all layers from a particular model so let's say uh, we would end up with then 725 models across all layers then can we look into how do these layers fit onto the brain is there like any systematicity there and this is like a pretty challenging question so this is also like super preliminary results um the left hand plot here shows the relative layer position on the x-axis. So one here would correspond to like the deepest layer, meaning the output layer, while uh, zero here is like the input layer. So just the embedding, for instance. Um, and we see a trend here that it seems that like the late intermediate layers um, converge towards optimal brain responses. And there was another recent paper, um, I would get to practice my French now maybe, uh, Cacheteux and King, um, also from this year, uh, that were also looking into different types of transformer networks. And they also found that there's something about these like late intermediate layers that really explain the brain response as well. And then another question, this gets even more <laughs> preliminary and vague, then you can start saying, oh, well, if the layers map differently onto the brain, can we then plot that? And this is like an example of uh, here, the colors again correspond to relative uh, layer position. So one is like the deepest layer. So for this particular subject, uh, this is plotting GPT-2XL, we can see, oh, there are some regions here that are purely predicted by the last layer, while somewhere it's like some of the earlier layers. Um, I don't have any like unified conclusion to draw from this, um, but I think it's like something that would be really interesting to look into in more like a systematic way at some point. Um, and last uh, point, which I hope will be pretty brief, is then can we like dissect these models to figure out like what makes them like predict the brain pretty well? Um, and this is a quite challenging question to ask, uh, especially when you use a lot of these like language models, because they are, as we call them, off the shelf. So they're like pre-trained uh, from someone else, and then they'll just like package. So we use them. We haven't trained them from scratch ourselves, which is like wildly computationally expensive. Um, so they differ in the way they were trained, in the way they were tokenized, how much they were trained on. So it's pretty hard to make a direct comparison. But we have like an exploratory analysis, uh, which is like tapping into the effect of model architecture and training. Um, so here we just tested how different like architectural properties and training properties, in addition to that next word prediction task, uh, would correlate with brain responses. And just uh, briefly, it seems that uh, the larger the model is, the more hidden layers, the more features it has, the better it also predicts uh, brain responses. And maybe it, there's a lot of confounds here, obviously, because as I mentioned, they were trained very differently, but also that the larger models are the more recent ones that were trained on like even better GPUs, even better hardware. So this is also somewhat like a, a hard comparison to make. But I would like to point out that um, if we want to tap into this question, uh, some people have started looking into how you can, you know, make more like systematic comparisons where you for instance, only compare the training. You only compare uh, one perturbation in terms of the architecture. Um, and another grad student in Dr. F. Fedorenko's lab, Ekbal Hosseini, is uh, presenting a poster on this in SN at Society, uh, the SNL conference, which is in two weeks. Um, and there's been some work on this like last year, the year before, um, trying to look at different like architectural features, such as like context length and how that plays a role in brain representations. And then there are also some 
work from more like computer science uh, domain uh, that look into like what do these attentional mechanisms do because it's really complex. So this is where you know neuroscience kind of have to work synergistically with computer science. Um, so this almost brings me to the end. Um, I would like to go through just a few points about this like mapping methodology and some of the decisions that are being made just to like kind of like recapitulate um, and then use that as, as like a basis for a discussion. Um, so yeah, basically, as I mentioned, you know, either you have to read the method section of these papers really closely to kind of get which decisions are being made, or you have to like play around with it yourself. Um, so here, I hope I can give like somewhat of an idea of which choices we actually do make. Um, so one thing that I mentioned, uh, we're just going to start out by the neural measurements is like, what do we want to fit the model to? Do you want to fit, fit it to voxels? Do you want to fit it to like a functional region of interest? Do you want to fit it to an anatomical region of interest? Um, there are many choices to be made here and many assumptions. Do you want to aggregate over regions or not? Um, another thing is, um, what are the selection criteria of the neural data that you include? Um, there are some papers that have criteria of um, if you include certain voxels, then we want them to be very stable over representations or that you already like pre-select maybe like voxels or like neural or neural data that already is just, you would already expect it to do well given some circumstances. So um, I think that's an interesting a thing to keep an eye out for. Um, then there's the normalization that I mentioned earlier, like we have noise in all neural data, we have to figure out what to do about it. In cognitive neuroscience, there seems to be no um, unified or like accepted way of doing this. So, you know, we just estimated like a signal to noise ceiling and divided everything by that. You could do this in many different ways. Um, Next, in terms of the similarity score, um, as I explained, we used our like regression fitting um, model where we have like an encoding model where we try to predict the brain recordings and rooted in this like encoding approach is, you know, the view that the brain is like processing information and we want to encode and like decode information from it. So one could also go the other way. We could do decoding as well. Um, and another metric which is also sometimes being used is uh, representational similarity analyses, RSA. So here, instead of fitting regressions, you basically create like these um, similarity uh, matrices. Uh, there's like a symmetric matrix, a symmet sorry, symmetric matrix, where instead of looking at actual brain responses, you're looking at similarities of responses. Um, and the reason why some people really like to use these is that intuitively, if you assume that you have a computationally accurate model of the brain, then you would also assume that the patterns of similarity between the brain activations and then the model activations would be similar. So that's like the underlying assumption here. Um, and we actually uh, looked into how our um, data generalizes to this representational similarity approach. So on the x-axis, we just have our normal encoding approach. And on the y-axis, we have using these like the similarity matrices. And we do see that there is a correlation. So that's fortunate. <laughs> um, and next, um, if you choose to use this like encoding or decoding approach, then obviously you are fitting some kind of regression. Uh, we just chose a simple linear regression, but this, no one says it has to be a linear regression. It could easily be like some simple nonlinear model. Um, it seems that this like linear readout assumption is widely accepted in like cognitive neuroscience, but often neural computations are nonlinear. Um, maybe there's nonlinearity when you record like the fMRI bold response. Maybe there's nonlinearity in the fact that you um, aggregate over brain regions or you have like successive neural computations. So that's another assumption that you have to be have to be aware of. 
Um, another thing, which was also a great question that was being posed earlier, is about, you know, these models have different number of like activations, right? They have different number of units. So you could maybe just expect, all right, the larger the model is, the better it would just fit any data. Um, so I think it's interesting to look into dimensionality reductions. You say, all right, let's uh, reduce all model activations to a set size. Um, or fit a model that penalizes, so like regular, regularizes, like as a rich regression, for instance, where you would like regularize um, the weights. And yeah, this also brings me to like the third point here, which is if you start choosing like a rich regression or some nonlinear model, then you have to tune some parameters. Um, some papers in this field use rich regression. And sometimes they like tune, there's one hyperparameter in a rich regression, the lambda value, and then you can like cross validate and find like an optimal value. Is that fair? Um, if you cross validate enough, maybe you can fit anything. Should you just set a value? Should you, yeah, what, what assumption, which assumptions are being made here? Um, next, um, which uh, Alison also taps into the question you asked, like, what do we want to predict? in like the optimal world, we would want to predict from one data set to a completely different data set, right? Um, and we would want to do more than just predicting between words. We'd want to do more than just predicting among sentences um, and more than just passages, right? Like we would want to like generalize as much as we can, but that does still seem to be a challenge. And a lot of papers doing this still only like cross validate and generalize over like relatively easy or like easier tasks but um i agree that this is like a really really important goal um and next uh you gotta you have to like figure out like what is what do you compare it to what's the baseline like what's like any baseline performance of this um so i think that we tried doing was to just take a random vector so say you have a model with size 700 then you just take a random vector of size 700 and then you see how well can that predict uh, the brain responses. Um, and here, what we see in the dark green bar is the performance of GPT-2XL, our top performing model, uh, which was close to the ceiling value. And then the light green bar is the random embedding. So um, we do see that the performance uh, decreases. So it means that not any feature space works. Um, and lastly, how do you want to e evaluate accuracy? Uh, we just reported um, these like R values. Um, some papers uh, actually uh, make this into like a binary task. Um, there's the one of the original papers uh, by Tom Mitchell et al. in Science in 2008 that were predicting meanings of nouns and they did like a pairwise comparison so if uh, your sentence is predicted better better than like a random sentence then you get a one otherwise you get a zero so it's like kind of like a binary accuracy task and some papers still do this um, in the field and it's definitely um, an approach that one can one can use but there's like some strong assumptions about how accurate you want your model to be um, yeah, so this is like all the different, <laughs> some of the different points you can think about. And just a quick summary slide um, about what we hopefully learned is that some of these ANN models seem to predict human neural responses to linguistic input with decently high accuracy. And next we see that this like neural predictivity uh, correlates across data sets spanning different recording modalities, fMRI and ECOG in this case, and across diverse materials that were presented both visually and auditorily. And next, it seems that a drive for this like online prediction uh, may be like a mechanism that shapes language processing in the human brain. Uh, so by that, we can discuss whether this is a good idea. Um, or not, and all the assumptions that are being made. And what time is it? Thanks so much, oh. Greta. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's two. Yeah, so um, 
I know we're heading up at time, so if you need to leave, feel free. But um, Greta, if you have time, maybe we can have a little bit of discussion here. Yeah, um, sure. If you're, if you're free. Definitely. Let's open it up to any questions or discussion. That would be great. Um, I have a question. Um, and I guess it kind of touches on the, the is it a good idea kind of <laughs> idea. Um, <laughs> So a lot of these models are like evaluated by or based on the idea of like next word prediction or like next phrase prediction. Um, I guess what is what is like your take on like how that is as an evaluation metric since like we like how, how well does a human like predict the next word in a sentence or something like that. And I guess continuing from that. Um, what do you see as like being the next step forward for abstraction away from something like next word prediction? Like, do you think it's something more like multimodal, like Allison was kind of touching on? Is it like prediction across languages? Um, like, what do you see as the next step forward for abstraction? Right. These are very interesting questions. Um, yeah. As you mentioned, a lot of these models are trained for next word prediction, which seems to work pretty well. But what we have also seen in like all the like computer science, natural language processing community is that even some of these models, like the GPT models that do really well on predicting the next word within a sentence and maybe within sentence two and three, they start really falling into some like traps in terms of like context and semantics so it seems that you know this abstraction level to a certain degree is still lacking um so one thing is that synergistically with like computer science we need to develop models that generalize better are more robust and can perform better abstractions um i'm currently taking a class actually uh with dr jacob andreas um about neurosymbolic approaches to do that. So instead of having these like distributed units, you would try to embed some symbolic structures. I think that's a really interesting approach. And I'd be curious how these like more symbolic structures compare to the brain. Um, in terms of what you mentioned, um, uh, in terms of generalizing to different languages, we actually had a model that was like a multilingual model. So that seems to work decently well. Um, otherwise, yeah, there's the multimodal approach because, you know, in some ways it seems ridiculous that humans, you know, take in like input from all modalities at all times. We have so much information. Um, and when we do these comparisons, we are only tapping into like a model that was trained on text and just text co-occurrence basically. And then we're trying to use that as like a mechanistic hypothesis of the brain. So in some ways it seems really coarse, but it's it's a beginning. So yeah, the multimodal approach is is something that I think is really exciting. I can also mention another thing that I'm really excited about in terms of like abstraction, uh, abstraction um, which would be that say you have a model that predicts the neural response pretty well. Could you then say, all right, I know this model predicts this region pretty well. Can I then go the other way and say, all right, I have this brain region. What would be the optimal like stimuli to drive that region? Um, there's a science paper from Bashivan et al. 2019 um, who do some that do something similar in uh, the visual domain with like uh, neural sites as well. So that is fun. Uh, thank you for the very interesting uh, talk. I have maybe a naive question, but let's say that maybe in a dozen years or something, we had some sort of model that perfectly predicted the neural responses to language or had perfect generalizability. Um, to what degree could we then look at that model as an explanation for how the brain mechanisms are working? So like, does the architecture of that perfect model, how, how, how do we bridge that gap um, to explain the neural mechanisms? 
Right, thank you. This is definitely not a naive question. Um, I didn't talk a lot about interpretability, actually. Um, and this is something that is, for some people, really crucial, and some people really don't care. It seems there, there's like two alleys, right? One alley is like, all right, we just need to maximize predictivity. It doesn't matter how the model looks like. Let's just like engineering wise maximize predictivity. And then said so the other alley who are like, oh, but we wanted to, you know, we want if we wanted to serve as like a mechanistic hypotheses of the brain, then we need to have like a somewhat biologically plausible implementation. And right now we are not doing anything that has to do with biological plausibility. Um, these architectures that predict well, um, it's so unclear how they even map onto different brain region, different processing stages. It's really, really challenging. Um, so as you say, if we at some point have a model that has great abst abstraction, it's like robust, predicts like the brain pretty well, then a next step would be to say, all right, uh, I know that in this part of the brain, we have X number of connections or the connections go this and this far. Can we then try to take these um, like restrictions, these like uh, this knowledge and then put that into the model and then build a more like plausible uh, model. That would be really, really interesting and is something that's you now being done in, in vision now. I think there's like a Europe's paper this year on if you exploit uh, some of the information from the brain on like uh, detection of the visual features, you can improve the model. So it kind of seems then it's like a synergistically loop of like integrating biological knowledge in these like computer science models, which where both parts actually seem to benefit. Uh, but in language, sadly, we are not there or fortunately because it means that there's a lot to do. So depends on how you see it. Yeah, thanks for the great question. Yeah, I don't know what people think about interpretability, whether it's important or not. Um, I may be also uncertain as to what I think myself. <laughs> so. um, right now, if a model like the GPT-2 is doing the best at predicting, are researchers right now able to suggest that there's similar mechanisms going on like how how valid do you think it is to be making those kinds of conclusions like what you were saying about um the brains implementing this optimal prediction thing maybe similarly right yeah that's that's a good question um i think we can start extrapolating on a very high level we can't extrapolate on like the low level mechanisms of the model. But what is interesting is that these transformer models that perform really well, what is like new about this transformer approach is that they have these attentional mechanisms. And if you think about it, like in the human brain, you know, what we do all the time and what makes a large part of what makes humans intelligent is that you're com always constantly able to figure out what do I want to focus my attention on? That's what makes me like not think about what's going on like outside my window or whatever right so in that sense like you can start creating these links on like a very high level which is interesting to start thinking about like oh attention matters like uh, online prediction for the next meaning to occur is, uh, is important and yeah no i think you can ex extrapolate some interesting concepts but on the lower level it's still really challenging I have a, a question. I don't know if you know about if anyone used like uh, use this artificial neural network and combine with developmental studies. Like maybe we can use some simple network on the mo models and then gradually uh, increase the uh, complex complexity and sophisticated. Uh, units into and then can predict the dynamic changes of the brain. Is that possible or do you know anyone is doing that? Um, that would be incredible and I don't know anyone who's doing it. So if anybody is working with uh, language development, uh, then email me. <laughs> uh, no, um, I actually don't know about anyone doing that, but it just seems like such 
clean approach or like somewhat clean approach besides the fact that I heard it's really challenging to record neural data from infants. But if we look away from that fact, it seems like obvious and oh, could we fit yeah, simpler models without different mechanisms to like earlier uh, developmental stages and then later on move on to complex stages and what actually changes. That would be a really in like interesting research program that I think <laughs> uh, one could work on for like the next like 50 years, probably. Um, another thing in that alley in terms of development, which I think is interesting is uh, these like language models are just like trained on like massive like corpora of text. Um, but I think the field of like curriculum learning as it's called is pretty interesting. So you would like first feed say like x number of like the most frequent words to the model then repeat them a lot of times then you like build on to like a next stage and kind of like trying to mimic how like humans do learn language uh to make these models more robust um there's some work on that i'm not like a know that much about the field but i think that's an interesting approach too yeah development is cool thanks thank you Any other questions for Je Greta? No, Thank you that. guys had some really, really great uh, questions, both like throughout the talk and after. So um, I think these are some of the like large uh, issues we have to consider. Um, and hopefully like this entire like framework can, you know, be like a, a basis of, of that. I feel like this is really cool and I feel like you have like a lot of work cut out for you like it like it, this seems so generative like there's so many options to go here you have like your so, whole career like filled automatically <laughs> there are so many things to do I yeah so many things to do for everyone yeah it's it's an interesting time for sure I feel very grateful I think I'm gonna stop sharing here but yeah definitely feel free to like reach out or yeah if you're interested well, speaking of gratitude, I just want to say thank you again. This was an amazing um, talk and yeah, very interesting. Um, just join me in thanking Greta. Thank you so much. This was really fun. I appreciate it. And uh, have an incredible weekend. Thanks. You too. Bye, everyone. Thank you.